theologian Walter Brueggemann in the prophetic imagination posits two ways of being that he reads in the stories of the Hebrew Bible. What he calls the royal consciousness is the call by those Hebrews who desire to be like all the great countries about them. They wanted to have a king to rule them like other countries did. So they went to Shmuel, the Samuel, and demanded, find us a king. Now, Shmuel spoke with God, and God said it was really a bad idea. So Shmuel went back to the people and told them what God said, warned them, if you get a king, you'll have to give up your sons to be in the king's army. You'll have to give up your goods to feed the king's government, and you'll have to give up your freedom to live in the king's legal system. And still the people clamored, give us a king. So Shmuel went to God and said, do you hear them? And God said, eh, what can I do? I'm only God. They want a king, give them a king. Shmuel looked around and found the bravest of the brave, the fairest of the fair. And Shaul, Saul, was named king. And the people gave up their sons and their daughters, their produce and their freedom, and became just like everybody else. That's royal consciousness. There had been another consciousness, an earlier consciousness. This was the system that had been established at the time of Moshe, Moses. Then it had been clear there really was only one ruler, not Moshe, who led them out of bondage, not Pharaoh, who had kept them in bondage, but the divine's own self, who led them by fire and smoke through the wilderness, the God whose name was I am who am, or I cause who causes. I am, I cause, was sufficient sovereign for the people who would become Israel. Mediating this sovereignty were some foundational ideas enunciated by the prophets, including Moshe, and further explicated by the judges. No monarchy was needed beyond the rule of God, which was the rule of law. This was the rule by which all the people were being a community on a journey together. This consciousness Brueggemann called prophetic consciousness. Brueggemann argues that prophetic consciousness is the divine intention for a religious community, people figuring it out on a journey together. The royal consciousness of keeping up with what everyone else is asking for permanent is asking for permanence in a world of impermanence. It's asking for certainty in a world of uncertainty. It's asking for rigidity in a world of constant change. Royal consciousness, this de desire to have some orange-headed leader, is unnatural. And it costs. I remember a time in my life, as I was becoming an adult, when we wondered whether our country had embraced too fully that royal consciousness. We had been waging wars forever, and we were waging a war in those days of my formation. Our sons and daughters were serving our royal consciousness. Our produce was feeding our royal consciousness. Our freedoms were being constrained for the sake of this royal consciousness. The United States was supporting war in Central America, and in this tiny 
country of El Salvador, spending $1.5 million a day to prop up the 14 families who ruled El Salvador, $1.5 million a day to support those who had murdered Jesuit priests, who spoke with and spoke for the poorest of the peasants, $1.5 million a day for the regime that killed Archbishop Romero, $1.5 million a day for those who had murdered among the thousands for American women. Jean Donovan, a lay missionary volunteer from Cleveland, American Ursuline sister, Dorothy Kazel, who brought her master's degree in counseling to her work among the poor in El Salvador. Mary Knoll sister, Mara Clark, who went from the St. Anthony of Padua School in the Bronx to aid people in Nicaragua displaced by uh, an earthquake and who was moved by Romero's appeal to come to El Salvador to aid the poorest of the poor with education and health care and political voice. And to Mary Knoll's sister, Ida Ford, who had escaped death in a flash flood just months earlier only because one of her sister companions rushed her and her car to safety even as that sister lost her life in the flood. $1.5 million a day for the rape and murder of these American outsiders, outsiders guided not by this American royal consciousness, but by the prophetic notion that the cause of truth and right is found in every beating heart. In our own American South, there was a royal consciousness that declared that white people had a God-given right to govern, that the governance would be enforced by laws that restricted voting, and that governance would be enforced when necessary by extreme violence. This whites-only royal consciousness had to be upended by the prophetic consciousness that I am a man, I am a woman, I am somebody, I am I am. The list of those killed in the struggle for the liberation of black folk is very long. Dr. Du Bois founded Crisis Magazine specifically to document lynchings across America. We have a recent Hollywood movie raising up the voice of Emmett Till and of his mother's struggle for justice. We have songs and statues for Denise McNair, Addie Mae Collins, Carol Robertson, and Cynthia Wesley, four 14-year-old girls killed when the 16th Street Baptist Church was bombed. The list is long. The list is long. At the center of that white supremacy royal consciousness policy was the denial of the right to vote. When we make our commitment to you, you, the vote, we declare prophetically that democracy is something sacred. As Dr. King and others called for supporters to be in solidarity with people in their own liberation parade, many came to show support. In Women's History Month, it would be remiss for Unitarian Universalists not to remember Viola Liuzzo. You may recall that Dr. King and others planned a Selma to Montgomery march. It was initially met with violence. They called it Bloody Sunday when they first tried to cross the Edmund Pettus Bridge, but then had to retreat and regroup and reconsider. Dr. King asked Unitarian Universalists to come to Selma and Viola Liuzzo said, sign me up. She was an active member of the NAACP in Detroit and joined the Ann Arbor UU congregation and left her children in the capable hands of her Teamster official husband and drove to Selma. Her children remember that she called home each and every night to hear about their day and to fill them in on what she was up to. Her daughter Sally, when she was six years old, remembers to the day that she learned, that there was a day that she learned to write her own name in cursive handwriting. And Viola asked her, write it big, leave it on the bureau. So that's the first thing that I see when I got home. Her children also remember that their mother, as a rule, hated wearing shoes. She walked in stocking feet and bare feet whenever she had the chance. 
You may have seen the favorite photo of the march showing Viola carrying her shoes. Walking barefoot was for her a way of life. Well, I can't see that photograph without thinking of that religious notion. At several times in the Hebrew Bible, stories are told of people removing their shoes because they are walking on holy ground. In many religious traditions, shoes are removed upon entering the temple. In Islam, the ritual of foot washing is part of preparing for prayer. Did Viola Liuzzo imagine that in marching for black folk to have access to voting, that she was in the presence of the divine? Did she know that she was walking against the royal consciousness and toward a prophetic consciousness? That she was walking with pi pi pillars of fire and smoke before her with I am who am, I cause who causes. That she was indeed marching in that liberation parade. Like Romero, like Liuzzo, we Unitarian Universalists believe that we are on that liberation parade. Liberation for all people who are oppressed and for all the institutions that oppress them. They need to be freed too. For all the genders we encounter and the heteronormative assumptions that are the sea in which we swim, those need to be liberated too for the immigrant and the native born, for the Palestinian and for the Israeli system that we support financially each and every day and that keeps everybody down. We are on the liberation parade that moves from an unthinking embrace of a royal consciousness toward a prophetic consciousness of the people, figuring it out together on a journey. After the success of the march, after Dr. King had made his speech, after all the celebrations, the blessings, the prayers, the hallelujahs, Mrs. Liuzzo did what she did. She showed up. She helped out. She drove people back to their cars in Selma. She drove people to the airport. And while she was driving, a car filled with members of the Ku Klux Klan, including an FBI informant who knew what was going on, pulled up alongside her, called her an epithet, shot her to death. Monsignor Romero did not pray for his death, did not ask for his death, but he did share a tragic hope that if one of the many death threats he received were to occur, that God would raise up an intention for liberation among the Salvadoran people. I do not know what Viola Liuzzo imagined, other than that she would soon be home with her husband and her kids. She'd see her daughter's signature proud on her bureau. If indeed her death is to mean something for us, may we not be the people who by our actions pro propose and perfect and project and promote a prophetic consciousness for our day, for our time, for our place. May we move in that liberation parade, knowing that the work we do is a holy work, that the people we are becoming are bearers of a prophetic consciousness, maybe even barefoot, and that the places we inhabit are indeed holy ground. May it be so. May it ever be so. Blessed be, Ashe, Ashe, peace, salam, shalom. I love you. Amen. Hi, and welcome to Getting the Message, where we dive a little bit deeper into our service themes for our service. And I am so excited to have a special guest with us today. Uh, as I often call him in, uh, in you know, text format, D D Reverend DCO, um, but the Reverend David Carl Olson. Um, uh, it's, it's wonderful to have you with us today. Well, it's a great uh, honor for me, um, both to be on my way to Fourth U, uh, but also to be with you, Ember. Um, I've enjoyed um, our camaraderie. 
Yes, yes. Uh, whether, you know, trips to get delicious Vietnamese food after services or our chances to talk, I, I always enjoy the chance. Yeah. So uh, I love getting to read through uh, this week's um, message and to uh, feel out the word that you're going to be bringing. And I'm really curious what inspired it. Uh, like what what kind of why this message for today? Sure. Well, you know, um, some of this comes out of my own uh, story uh, in that in the 1980s, I did a lot of uh, solidarity work. Um, with Central America. Um, and as a matter of fact, culminating in uh, the early 90s, being um, a UN certified election observer for the first uh, elections in El Salvador um, after the end of the Civil War. I um, can't uh, avoid in that work the uh, perpetual reference to uh, Oscar Romero, um, who, while he was indeed an archbishop, um, was known mostly as Monsignor, right? That um, that there was an affection that he had for his people. He's a guy who, who changed in his life um, from a kind of uh, dyed-in-the-wool, conservative-ish uh, Roman Catholic to actually coming to this big question, what is the church for and in a place where the church dominated the thinking of a people um what does it mean that it perpetually bows to the 14 families that rule the politics and economy of the place and does not sufficiently minister to the great numbers of people who are in poverty so that's the um the, the a thing that just comes comes back again and again for me what is the purpose of these religious institutions um that we inhabit and perpetuate and what authentic relationships do we have to mm. people who are in pain people who are in struggle um and how do we minister so that's that, that that's yeah. kind of where it comes from yeah well, you know and i think that to me uh, as you were saying that it, you know it made me think working in a, co a congregation in uh new york city like new york city very much is a center of power in our in our country and of influence in our country and so like you know these these are important things for us to consider about what it means to be um, members of a liberal religious community um, mm -hmm. in, in this context. Um, so was there any, like, obviously you were talking about personal experiences, but was there any like books that you'd maybe recommend or that you drew on as you worked on this? Well, so let me say personal experience was very important. Um, and I will tell you, <clears throat> pardon me, I was doing a uh, congregation-based community organizing um, with what is now a very large um, organization that I helped to found and was the president of Greater Boston Interfaith Organization. And one of the key um, components of our solidarity as an organization was the work of Catholic sisters. So the, those relationships with these women who just devoted their lives to their um, sense of, of gift and uh, using their gift um, for the people that they had had an assignment for. Um, in the midst of that, someone said, have you ever read The Violence of Love? And The Violence of Love is a collection of the um, uh, prayers, uh, radio addresses, sermons um, of um, Oscar Romero. And they're uh, over the course of his um uh, the tenure of his his bishopric, um, and um, including you know just the the day before he was assassinated, um, and um, this it's not a it's you have to, I have to read it with you you eyes. Um, uh, I'm not I'm not a Catholic. Um, I don't um, uh, see the sacramental in the sacrament of in and of itself. I discover the sacramental in thinking it through, feeling it through, being willing to be amazed by uh, the mystery of things, um, and the assertion that we belong to each other. That's just an astonishing astonishing things to, thing to me. And this notion of the violence of love, 
um, which is in some ways a, a self-violence, that um, a choice to not just think of myself, but to understand myself as connected to every other, to understand that I have to give something um, to really express the love that I have for someone. Um, and he, you know, Romero will talk about the, the the violence of hatred, which is so easy to see, but what's the violence of love? And is there something saving um, when each of us chooses us over choosing me? Uh, mm -hmm. anyway. Right. Well, and so one of the things that as I read through your your transcript uh, that really stood out to me uh, was this this, you know, imagery of being people who are figuring it out on a journey together. Uh, a few years ago, uh, we had a um, we had a uh, an educational event. I don't even remember which one it was at this point. But someone asked, you know, like in a in a perfect world, like you know, does religion still exist? You know, does like a, in a, in a in a post revolution world, in a like and you know, if things were radically changed, would the would religion still exist? And how how would that look like? And I said that, you know, I think that when Unitarian Universalism is working at its best, that it actually inspires me with like the vision of what I could see, like religion's place being in a in a more just world where justice is more flourishing in the wider world. And that is still being this place of kind of this this people figuring out life together on a journey together, because like, you know, one of the things that I've loved about my work is like getting to work with someone who's a humanist that I had my own journey to figure to, to deciding that I was pagan, uh, that I have um, Jewish coworkers, that I have Buddhist coworkers that and uh, congregants and everyone all representing all these different views and that I get to journey together with them instead of like, instead of trying to see myself in an exclusive way of relationship to them to, to get to do this journey together. And I think that, yeah, that that imagery of journeying together is is really powerful to me. Um, but, you know, so I'm just going to say that um, it was very meaningful for me to go down to Selma, Alabama, um, to uh, I've done it a few times, but to be there for the I guess the 50th anniversary of of of, of Bloody Sunday, um, and um, to uh, actually. Uh, think about what it took for the large number of uh, Unitarian Universalist clergy who went to Selma, but also for people like Viola Liuzzo, who, you know, she's a lay person. She's a person who knows the truth um, of Detroit, um, of the Northern migration. Um, she knows um, the, she's heard the stories of her neighbors and she chooses to go down to Selma um, and to walk barefoot. And that's one of the things I just love about her, that, that a, a person who, um, who has to be that in touch with the earth, that in touch with the, 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 the reality of the journey, um, that she's walking barefoot. Um, and I, you know, I, I play with the idea of um, the traditions in which one removes one's shoes when one enters into holy ground. And I have a sense that while she was on that journey to Montgomery, I don't think for a second she imagined that getting to Montgomery was the end. <laughs> that we're, you know, if we, we figure out what this um, 80 miles looks like, um, we have yet to figure out what the next million miles are. Uh, but um, when many people walk, one way a road is made um, and so we, uh, we 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 find our way um i uh i acknowledge the challenge of this notion of onward and upward forever this kind of progressive notion because of course that says where we are today isn't good enough um, and I don't know how to acknowledge simultaneously I, I don't know how to acknowledge i want to acknowledge simultaneously that right now <clears throat> We have the choice to do what's good enough. We, we absolutely do. And we understand that tomorrow is going to have a new set of possibilities. Right. Uh, yeah, new potential. Right. In the in the Calvinist world that I uh, spent some time in, yes. uh, we often we often said already, but not yet. Uh, and, you know, that was, you know, that was more about like this idea of, of like how the return of Jesus was going to work. You know, that's that's a whole very not you, you concept. But like that same 
uh, you know, the Calvinism kind of either went on to become this very conservative Calvinism or to become like, you know, the more middle ground, like UCC congregationalism. But then a lot of them did go on to become uh, these congregations that were very, very heavily Calvinist in the founding of the United States went on to become what, UU congregations down the line. So, you know, I think that that, that exists a little bit in our um, this idea of of both seeing like what you said that we can see that the present moment has its beauty has these moments that we can find this this moment of becoming uh, and but also see that there's still work to be done and things to to work towards. And in some ways, isn't that what the um, spring message is? for all of us, right? That there's, there's something bursting forth, that life is bursting forth. You know, I remember I was driving one of my old crappy cars. I, By the way, almost any car I drive understands that its next destination is the crusher. Okay. Um, but um, so I have, I have experience with cars breaking down and whatever. And there was one day I was on the Cross Bronx Expressway and my car started to show that it was going to die. So I, I got off and I got up this ramp as far as I could and pulled the car over and called AAA. And as I sat there, I looked in the um, at the curb and there was piles of crap right? Just piles of crap. But right in the middle of piles of crap were these little sprouts that were coming up. And I just think about that, that um, that, 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 that life uh, is just bursting forth everywhere. Um, and I think that, you know, we get a chance to uh, nurture <clears throat> that which is uh, going to be beneficial. And I hope we get a chance to prune that which is going to be toxic, but that's another story. Um, but I think that that's a piece of where hope comes from for me. Um, and now for me, part of the nurturing is to nurture the people's movement, uh, is to nurture congregations like Fourth U um, and other uh, congregations with whom we might be in relationship and people beyond congregations in unions and political parties and all you know, student organizations, etc. I think that um, that's a way by which we nurture that which is um, being born. Uh, and I hope that's also a way that we trim some of the limits of um, or, or contain uh, some of the limits of Trumpism and um, the, 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 the things that we face um, that really could lead us in an incredibly negative anti-democratic uh, uh, direction. Um, so I think, uh, yeah, I, I don't want to be say everything's coming up roses only because I think there are a few weeds there too. Thank you very much. Um, and the people's movement needs to be vigilant um, because populism may take us one way where a different kind of um, um, people's organization might take us in another direction. Um, so we got choices to make, but I think we're figuring it out. Um, we're figuring it out. Um, and for me, I, the only way I can figure it out is with other people, um, with the best that tradition brings, with the best that science brings, with the best that my personal experience brings, um, with the best that our collective experience in the gathering on a Sunday morning and sharing music and sh opening our hearts, um, being with one another and and uh, for those of us who have a smile and have a chance to hold the hand with those of us who are a little sad this day and say we're in this together, mm, something okay. like that. Mm. Well, thank you so much for both sharing your words with Fourth You, but also for sharing this time together with me. Well, Amber, it's been my great joy, um, and I'm really looking forward uh, again to being um, at Fourth You on Sunday um, and for the next time we go out for pho. <laughs> always a good plan and all thanks right. thanks as always to all of our listeners <laughs>